Hi, I'm Vicki Hanna and I'm reporting for KTV. I'm in Chapel Hill at the Carolina Inn. I don't know if you know this, but the Carolina Inn is a haunted hotel now and they have some fun ghost hunts you can go on. Come here and they'll show you where there are some haunted rooms and they have some professionals come in and show you where you can go, what kind of cameras you should use and answer any questions that you have. And they also include a dinner. So it should be a lot of fun. We're gonna show you what to do. So just follow us along. And when you get here for the ghost hunt, this is who you're gonna meet. We have Christopher Min. Hi Christopher. Hi there, how are you? Good. Okay, now a lot of people aren't gonna know about your job, so could you explain what you do? Absolutely. Basically, I'm a, uh, a scientific paranormal investigator. I, uh, I really don't rely on anything that has to do with psychics, just equipment that can detect the paranormal. Um, the United States, or do you go out of the country and do these ghost hunts? Mainly in the United States. Uh, we deal mainly with hotels that have a haunted reputation or a haunted history. Uh, we invite people in and, and uh, invite them to come to our class and learn a little bit more about this. Now, the Carolina Inn just recently became, well, at least they have declared that they're haunted. What did they have to go through? According to back, legends and tales and things along those lines. When they did invite us to come down here to perform our first event, we wanted to come in with an open mind, not knowing any of the history whatsoever, and see if we could collect paranormal evidence on our own, which of course we did. Okay, so how is the whole inn haunted, or is there specific rooms? Well, there's rooms that are more haunted than others, but the entire inn does have a paranormal presence that uh, goes throughout. Okay, well, this should be interesting. So when people do come here, they are going to first get a slideshow that will explain, I guess, everything about the paranormal to them? Absolutely. What we do is we actually have people come into a PowerPoint presentation, uh, explains all the tools of the trade, the terminology that we use, examine some of the evidence that we've collected over time. You go to other ghost hunts, where is this a fun place that you would suggest? <laughs> There's so many all around the country. Um, one of my favorites is the Lumber Baron Inn in Denver, Colorado. Uh, it has a definite haunted history. We work with the Denver Police Department on a cold case file there, and uh, it just has a great paranormal feel to it. I think I heard you mention something about a video game that they have asked you to give them some information. Absolutely. I worked with Nintendo uh, games on a, a game called Geist. It's actually a paranormal video game. Uh, it's, it's an interesting storyline that goes along with it. And they asked me to come in and review the game and become a spokesman uh, for the game. And I did do that. It was a lot of fun. Now, when should we be looking for that? Well, it's actually on the shelves now. It uh, debuted September 15th, I believe. And uh, it's become very popular already. Have you played it yet? Oh yeah, I had the advanced, uh, had the advanced copies, and of course they had to pry me away from the game. So. <laughs> it was a lot of fun. Now, is it rated mature? It is rated M, which is strange for Nintendo. They usually don't have rated M games, but uh, this is their first attempt at it, and they did a great job. Okay. Well, I guess next we want to go around to all the people in the audience and find out their stories and find out why they're here. So, well, thank you very much. I'm looking forward to it. Thank you. Great. Great. Thank you. Hi, my name is Kaylee Smith. Um, I'm here with my mom, and I've seen some stuff in my grandparents' house. I okay. sleep. Stuff will grab your feet sometimes. It'll seem like somebody's flashing a flashlight at your face. Uh. Thumbs, you know. It's an old house. It's like 200 years old, but it's, it's really creepy. Actually. <laughs> <laughs> stories since I was a child. They're my favorite form of uh, genre of fiction. I especially love M.R. James and uh, J.S. Lefanu and Henry James and uh, Algernon Blackwood and Oliver Onions and all those. But I've also been interested in true ghost stories and though I'm really fascinated by the idea of true ghost stories, I think, I'm not sure that there's a lot of hard evidence that most alleged true ghost stories are in fact true. I think that the true ghost stories that happen are probably much less spectacular than the legends about based on them that come down to us, but I've, I've just uh, 
My feelings on ghosts can be summed up in the famous statement, do you believe in ghosts? No, but I'm afraid of them. <laughs> Here at this hotel, as a night auditor, and had some real life experiences that I'd like to talk about later, maybe. Oh, Please do. Absolutely. As an auditor, I worked behind the front desk, balancing credit cards and food and beverage accounts. And then I had to come into the kitchen area to pull a report from an NCR machine. Well, as you came into the room, it was a door that I pushed open, and this door would make a noise. <laughs> so whenever I heard that noise, I always anticipated someone walking by, because that's the only reason why the door would make that noise. Well, at 11 o'clock, there was no one here but me, my supervisor, and security. So when I hear that noise, it's either security or my supervisor. Well, at least, at least twice a night, I'd hear this noise and no one. So I said, oh, it's probably security playing a little joke, you know, he's bored. But then I'd, you know, I, I would hear the noise and I'd get up to catch security and I look out, and it's a, it's a hallway this way. Nobody. I said, God, he can't be that fast. He's got to be that fast. <laughs> Nothing. Okay, the same thing was happening to my supervisor. And we all thought it was each other. So finally, we got together and talked about it, and we realized that it was neither one of us because there was no way for you to walk by and push that door and then make it back to the front desk without someone seeing you. Okay. Other things would be, I hear voices in the kitchen. I get up, and it's faint, so I can't really make out the voices. I go through the whole kitchen. Nobody. I'd ask my supervisor, were you in the kitchen talking? No. So these were the things that I experienced here, as well as the elevator door opening when you'd walk by. Uh, I found the ghosts, if you want to call it that, to be pretty friendly. I mean. You know, never did they frighten you. It was just very peculiar. And it's ironic because I never knew that Mrs. Skinner was really into this because I would have communicated it you know, to her. I would tell my supervisor, and she'd say, well, Ken, you know, it's just one of those things. Come on, we've got to balance these credit cards. <laughs> but I knew, I always knew that there was something here. And I was so glad. I looked at the news the other night and I saw something, I said, ooh, someone else has discovered something there. And I produced TV shows here in Chapel Hill, along with Mrs. Hannah here. So we decided to come out tonight and, and, and do a TV show of this. So those of you who live in Chapel Hill can get Cable 8. Um, I'm not sure when it's going to air, but we're going to air this for a whole month. Because I'm really fascinated that someone else discovered something that I always knew that there was something here. So. Thank you very much. So, uh, our main goal in Ghost Hunting is not necessarily just to take a picture or get a reading or get a piece of video or whatever the case might be. It's really the pursuit of putting this all together in a scientific basis, in a scientific manner. And when photography first came about, uh, was people taking and superimposing the pictures of quote unquote ghosts into the background mm -hmm. of these things. So now we're very careful when we, we, uh, we say spirit photography because when you tell a skeptic ghost photography, they're quick to point out that uh, the pictures must be fake. So <laughs> if you can talk about this picture, by the way, this will stay tuned. 3.2 is definitely the best way to go. I'm sure everybody's seen the TV show Medium on NBC I love or some of these new shows that have come out. Um, really the difference between paraforensics and psychic uh, intervention is that we go out and we collect physical evidence to support the case. Um, in this case, this is uh, this house that's, that's featured here is called the uh, Lumber Baron Inn. And uh, we do uh, several ghost hunting universities there each year. It's the site of a, a, a 30 year old unsolved double homicide. Uh, two young girls were actually killed there. The crime has never been solved. And we went in uh, and did our first university. I think it was our first, was it our second? First university there, and uh, we were doing our introductions much like we do today, sending the microphone around the room. And uh, noticed one person in the back of the room with his arms folded like this, and he did not look like he wanted to be there. And uh, his wife introduced him and said, 
he's part of the uh, Denver Police Department, he's actually a detective, and I have absolutely drug him along, he thinks that this is a bunch of hooey. And he said, oh, yeah, I mean, I'd be really surprised if any of this was true. So what he'd done is he actually dug back into the cold case and pulled out some facts that weren't released to the public. Well, uh, to make a long story short, we went through and took pictures, and did DVP, uh, did some video and things along those lines, and captured a lot of the uh, evidence that he had actually looked up. And he was shocked for the fact that he said, I don't know how you did this because none of this was ever released to the general public. We actually pulled out several bits of evidence that night that both he knew and didn't know, and we are actually now working with the Denver Police Department on this cold case file, uh, hoping to solve it here soon. And so we're very proud that the Carolina Inn now rests on that site. John Sparthill, I'm very certain you all that history, and so he, he realized this was the perfect spot to locate his Carolina Inn. So he built the Carolina Inn, and it opened in 1924. And this was a hat. All the skeleton keys went away. We got electronic locks. This room was totally changed, enlarged, chopped up, Floor removed, parquet floor removed, other flooring put down, just totally changed. And I thought, I think that's the end of Dr. Jacobs. He is gone forever. What's he going to do with those electronic locks, you know? Well, the story started again. So we think Dr. Jacobs is still there. We think Dr. Jacobs is up to his hijinks. And we have created the story, I have to tell you, in order to have a good ghost story, you have to know, you know, who stayed in the room. You have to have things that happen. And then you have to figure out why is that person doing that, particularly in Dr. Jacobs' case, because he was locking people out of his room. But we did learn that he was very particular about his patrons and all of his things. So we just don't think he wants people in his room because he doesn't want his stuff messed with. <laughs> My name is Mike Troy. I'm really here to portray a ghost to give a preview of coming attractions. Horace Williams was without doubt the most important teacher in the history of UNC. His biographer, Robert Watson Winston, lived in this inn from 1925 until his death in 1944. Robert was Horace Williams' biographer while he lived here. My short presentation about this is entitled, Water from Another Time. We are here to find ghosts. What is a ghost but an angel? Are they not merely the incorporeal realities, the spirits of a place, which reside in the spirit of the place? I submit they are. The Carolina Inn is filled with spirits. The place itself is the distilled, refined, abiding spirit of this village, this town, this complex, simple place, Chapel Hill, home of the oldest public university in our country. When the Carolina Inn was opened in 1925, one of its earliest resident guests was Robert Watson Winston. He actually came from Bertie County, where apparently Dr. Jaycock went to die. <laughs> he came here to live in the bosom of his alma mater, where he had uh, attended undergraduate and then law school between 1875 and 1881. He had been a brilliant lawyer and then a judge and in 1925, he retired at age 65 and returned to UNC and enrolled as a freshman for a second time. Robert lived here for 20 years until his death here in 1944. Most importantly, he became the student and then protege, friend and companion of a fellow widower, his contemporary, Professor Horace Williams. Horace had founded the philosophy department here in 1891 at the invitation of George Winston, elder brother of Robert Watson Winston. Horace taught philosophy here for 50 years. Horace and Robert were doubtless often together 
at this place and at the Horace Williams house on Franklin Street, the other magical haunted structure that still exists in this town, the present home of the Preservation Society of Chapel Hill, Catherine's Joint. <laughs> Walk around and feel Robert and Horace's spirit speak to your feet in those two places. Horace Williams taught philosophy here on his feet without a textbook or even notes. The students adored him, although he was a severe critic and a harsh grader. He and his wife Bertha had no children of their own, but he was a father figure for 5,000 young North Carolinians. Read chapter 59 of Thomas Wolfe's Look Homeward Angel. Thomas Wolfe, Senator Sam Irving, and playwright Paul Green were Horace's students. They wrote and spoke of him throughout their lives. He taught them how to think, they said. Margaret Skinner and I are now in the early planning stage of what we hope will be an ongoing presentation in which I will portray Robert Winston's ghost who still lives here in his old room. He will be remembering Horace, Thomas Wolfe, Sam Irving, and all those bright blue spirits whose heels are still a little stuck to this place. <laughs> Horace died at Horace Williams House in 1940. Robert published Horace's biography in 1942 to great plaudits and acclaim from the powers of this campus. Then Robert died here at the end in his bed in October of 1944. He was in his heavens. Why should he leave? He didn't. Please come. <laughs> Please come meet Robert and through him Horace himself. Let us all become freshmen again. Let us learn philosophy by walking around these places where philosophy abides. What Horace taught was oh so simple. When things go wrong, don't go forward faster and stronger. Stop. Take a deep breath like your mother taught you. Look at everything again with new eyes. Question everything. Identify your misstep. Start over. Simplicity abides. Bedrock truth remains. Find it. It is still right here beneath our feet. Come and join us and walk with us upon the truth. If we are going to find our future, we will find it in our past. Let's all look together. My closing poem is entitled, Water from Another Time. The taste of the water from our backyard pump I still remember well. What made it so distinctive was the slightly rusty smell. You see, the pump was old and rusty, and so to help it prime, we left some water in the bucket. It was water from another time. On Saturday night in our backyard, there'd always be a crowd with every sort of instrument and voices that sang loud. There was storytelling and remembrance sprinkled in amongst the songs. As a child, I knew I'd relive those nights throughout my whole life long. Now when I'm alone, I sing those songs and my tears of joy taste fine. In my head, I hear an elfin voice saying, water from another time. Around me, all the just do it people are moving forward fast. They look at me with pity, I live so much in the past. They don't have any old songs to sing. There ain't no rust on them. If they heard an elf, they'd tell their shrink who'd soon get rid of him. <laughs> ain't life always a circle? Don't joy always taste fine. My primal elf sings, I don't run out of water from another time. Thank you. Okay, before we go ghost hunting, you have to have some instruments. And Jackie is holding the tri-filled meter. And what does this one do? This picks up um, magnetic energy. And it won't pick up electrical energy, so anything that's natural, it'll pick up. Okay, great. So, I guess when this starts getting some kind of reading, everybody should start taking their pictures? Yes. Okay. I'm supposed to say shoot. <laughs> okay. Now, what do you have? A white noise machine. Allegedly, it will draw the ghosts. Are you ready to go ghost hunting? Because we are. Think we're going to find anything, Ken? I hope so. Okay. Everybody's getting ready to go, so let's follow them and see what we can find. This is going to be exciting. Taking pictures of the ghosts. Here before, this door, when it opened, it used to squeak. And every time 
of the street, you always anticipate someone to walk by. However, many a night this door would squeak and no one would walk by. So we here at the Carolina Inn. Okay, we are in the room now, and John, he already found an orb out in the hallway and one in here. So we'll try to get you some pictures later so you can see him, but he is like really good. Okay, so John has taken a lot of pictures and had a lot of success with the orb. So he's going to show us three here that he took. This is at a haunted farm in Lancaster, South Carolina. Um, it's been featured on the Mari Show, the Sally Show, and CNN, and the Travel Channel. And it's very active, and it's got some unusual colors. As you can see, a green orb, and then it, we have a red orb. And um, a red is a sign of strength. and a white orb and the, in the white orb we have a face it's kind of hard to see it exactly but the face is kind of leaning toward the side to the to the right but um, this is all from uh, a haunted farm in Lancaster South Carolina well do you get scared with any of these things or are you yes um, to be honest with you 90 percent of what I do is I'm by myself because a lot of times I don't have nobody to go with me but um, yeah, to be honest with you, I, I do get a little creepy or spooked, but um, I also look at that as experience. Um, to, for me to go into a place and not feel any kind of those feelings, I just think that there would be something paranormal with myself. <laughs> <laughs> This particular one, this is my favorite. I love this one. Yeah. This was taken uh, at the Castle Inn in New Orleans. As you can see, this is Chris walking down uh, a hallway on the third floor. This room is called the Voodoo Room. This room is so haunted that they can't even rent it out. It's so bad. Uh, as you can see, this is um, more orbs than I have personally seen anywhere. This is a great picture. This gives you an idea of some of the evidence you, you can get. Uh, at this particular inn, uh, this place was so haunted that my dear husband over here wouldn't take his clothes off or his shoes off to spend the night. He was actually ready to bolt at any moment in time out the door. We had some very interesting <laughs> experiences there when we went to bed for the night. My husband being a world traveler, he's always out there somewhere in the world. He always locks the door. This is the number one first thing he always does. When we retired, he locked the door. We went to bed approximately 4.30 in the morning. We hear this rap on the door, and it was very familiar. It was definitely Chris's knock. We both sat up in bed and thought there must be a major problem. We went running to the door, flung it open, and no one was there. What was really interesting is that the door was unlocked. Oh. We went back to bed, of course, not more than an hour later, the knocks on the door as we run to the door, fling it open, no one was there. Again, the door was unlocked. All night we could hear furniture being moved upstairs above us, and of course no one was up there. We could also hear a little child's feet running across the floor. This is in fact one of the most terrifying haunted places I have ever been. Interesting place. This, in fact, is the place where Tennessee Williams finished his play, Streetcar Named Desire. Real, real interesting place. This is the, uh, like the carriage house or the, yeah, the caretaker's house. This is a very unusual place. 
when you go in and actually the floors feel slanted, they feel like they're moving and you have a tendency to want to kind of run up against the wall, it's the most unusual feeling. If you'll notice the amount of orbs on the ceiling and the walls, there's obviously a lot of activity here. This one is a real interesting one. This is the one we were talking about in Atchison, Kansas. It kind of looks like it should be haunted, right? Mm -hmm. Look at the orbs around the trees and the roof, and look at the top window. Now, this is where supposedly that Sally died. For those of you who remember Chris's story about the little girl that had the operation in the upstairs bedroom of the doctors, this is, this is where uh, it happened. And of a lot of places we've investigated, this is where we've actually gotten the most evidence, and this is where Chris has probably suffered the most physically by being attacked by some entity. We don't believe it is Sally. We do believe it is a, a woman, uh, an older woman than Sally. Uh, she's quite vicious, and uh, she's given him a run for his money. Some of these ideas, but I'm not an expert, and I've never formally engaged in this before, so. And were you surprised to actually see people taking pictures tonight and getting orbs in the pictures? No, such things happen. I don't know if they're conclusive proof of the existence of the supernatural or not, but they're very interesting. So that will keep people interested and keep them coming back for more. Yeah. So it ended up being a fun evening? Very much so. So would you recommend this to people? Highly. Okay. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. And I've had uh, several paranormal experiences in my past. And uh, a ghost rode with me from Hillsborough to Durham last Friday, actually, in my truck. Um, I'll tell you more about that later. But what I'm writing the share after saying that. I'm sorry. Yeah, it was just there. Yeah, there is. It was it was one of those smelling ghost uh, incidences where I was borrowing a lawnmower from a friend of mine. It belonged to his father. It was his father's favorite lawnmower, and his father was a heavy drinker and it had cancer of the liver. And we loaded up the lawnmower, and I started driving away, and it smelled like someone had poured a beer in my seat. So I got to Durham and I said, Gary, thanks a lot for letting me use the lawnmower. I'll take good care of it and get it back when it needs to be. And it went away after about 20 minutes. Wow. So, yeah. I don't think the police would have bought that. Though. No, not. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. But I'm also writing an article for a local paper about this, too. Right. So, thank you. experiences with benevolent spirits of family members and also other experiences with in strange places, but um, with benevolent spirits, it seems like the the other world that I've experienced seems more benevolent than this world. That's one thing that I'm interested in the way that you've been able to photograph spirit. The spirit. Hi, I'm Eileen Bear, uh, Lynn's wife, and um, I thought it would be fun. I watch all those ghost shows and paranoid things on TV. So all right. here I am to the photographs, and there are lots and lots of photographs in the stories of the room. This is free. You can pick this up at uh, the concierge desk or at the front desk if you're interested in this. And then we have a history of the Carolina Inn, which was thoroughly researched by Ken Zogron. It's a wonderful book to read. It has so much of the history of the university because a lot that happened to the university <coughs> and to all of North Carolina happened right here at the Carolina Inn. And this is for sale at the desk at the Carolina Inn.